What is going on, Diesel Nation? We're excited to have you guys with us today on the Diesel Podcast. If you're watching this on YouTube and aren't subscribed, make sure and click the subscribe button, like, comment, let us know what you think about the episode. If there's a particular guest or topic that you'd like to have covered, we're always checking your feedback on there and love to be able to take your suggestions and then get them onto future episodes. Today, I'm going to be joined by Clint Cannon, the founder of ATS Diesel Performance, and I wanted to ask him about turbo upgrades with emissions and tack trucks. Is there a lot to gain? And if so, what kind of gain Gains can we expect to see either with a single turbo or in a compound turbo setup? So I'm definitely looking forward to chatting with him today. Before we get to it, though, I want to re- remind you our friends at DMAX Store. We had an awesome episode with them um, earlier in the year, and they have a complete lineup of products. We got an LB7 all the way to L5P. They've got a ton of upgrades, maintenance parts, things to make sure that your truck stays running, stays on the road, and runs the best that it can. So head on over to dmaxstore.com, check out what they have, and if you have questions about any particular part of your truck, maybe future upgrades, things you'd like to change, they're always really helpful. Look forward to chatting with you and be able to make sure you make the best decision for your truck. All right, let's get to today's podcast with Clint from ATS Diesel Performance and talking turbos clint welcome back to the diesel podcast i've definitely enjoyed our chats learning about gosh so much with transmissions 68 rfes allison's <laughs> a bunch of different topics and a huge one and i think might be one of the coolest upgrades that a truck enthusiast wants to do is a turbo upgrade it's something that you know we can see feel the power the torque the efficiency if there's a little bit of sound the egt drop and the market has changed so much with turbo so i'm excited to chat with you the turbo setups and the lines that ATS has, I think is going to be really cool to jump into and learn more about. Yeah, no turbos and uh, turbos are exciting. They're, they're, they're probably a little bit more exciting than transmissions, but yeah. <laughs> any, uh, anytime I can talk about turbos or transmissions or electronics, I get very excited. L- luckily we have those things to talk about. Otherwise I don't know if I'd have anything to talk about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's uh, the, the the world of turbos is is interesting and and like you say, I don't think anything's changed as much in the industry of the last ten years as turbo technology. You know, it has been a it's been a it's been quite a ride. You know, obviously with the introduction of emissions controls and then obviously emission emissions enforcement. You know, there's really has really stressed the turbo world. You know, we can talk about that quite a bit, you know, in, in, in depth, but, but, you know, every diesel truck, you know, needs a turbo. I mean, it's part of the system, you know, it's not like the days of old, you know, where you could have a normally aspirated diesel um, or you could turbocharge it. You know, it's, it was kind of like one or the other, you know, if the, when we go back in the, back in the old, old years, say, you know, like prior to 94, you know, the Ford Power Stroke, you know, there's 6973 was normally aspirated. You know, if you could imagine that, you know, and, you know, me being from Colorado, it's, it, you can't imagine that because we have no oxygen. You know, we can, <laughs> you, I mean, we're out of breath, breath when you, when you walk up a set of stairs, you know, much less than that's pretty much what you get with the diesel. You know, diesel, it just requires that oxygen rich content. You know, you have to have boosted air into the engine for diesel to burn you know and and we go back in the back in time you know these normal aspirated diesels not only were they not turbocharged but they were also low pressure injection diesel and they were mostly pre-cup cylinders you know and you know talk about you know not to get off turbochargers but talk about internal combustion motors you know a a a pre-cup um indirect injection diesel which you know all the old six fives and the in the six nines and all of them instead of having the injector that would inject fuel directly into the cylinder they would they had what they called a pre-cup and this pre-cup cylinder was a small pocket it excuse me inside the head that sits off to the side of the combustion chamber and as the piston would come up and it would it would push air compressed air like into this pre-cup cylinder and this little pre-cup cylinder is like a little tumor like inside the head, it's like this little growth type thing. Is this a is this a spherical chamber, right? And all the air would squish into that little chamber, and it would create extra heat, and it'd have a glow plug in it, and then diesel would be injected into this pre-cup cylinder, and then the ignition so- source would start to propagate in this pre-cup cylinder, and then and then expanded gases would push out of that little cylinder into the 
combustion chamber of the engine and push the piston down. Well, that was just grossly inefficient. You know, it just didn't burn well. I mean, they wouldn't even start when they were cold. You know, in fact, they wouldn't even hardly run for the first minute without the glow plugs running. So, you know, you, you advance, you know, 20, 30 years where we're at today and we have these high pressure injection systems that are direct injection. And, the, you know, the, the science, the technology of the injector and the cup and the piston and everything is just so far uh, ahead of where we were, you know, but if we go back to those old injection, those, those old diesels, you know, that's where it was discovered that strapping a turbocharger onto this motor, you know, is a really good way to extract heat energy from the engine and drive the turbine and turn drive a compressor and, 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 and shove, you know, compressed air into the engine to make it more, to, to, to increase the volumetric efficiency of the diesel and give it more oxygen. So, you know, <clears throat> in these 30 years, I mean, turbo as engine technology increased and got better, you know, turbo technology increased and got better. And, you know, really for the first 10 years of that was kind of, you know, trying to figure out how big of a, of a turbocharger to put on these engines, you know, and then as, then as we, then as time started to progress, you know, then, then the whole industry started really working a lot on compressor, you know, actual compressor wheel technology. And ironically, of course, as you remember, everything just kept getting bigger, yeah. you know, bigger turbo, let's go bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and, you know, bigger is not better. You know, it's funny is that the turbochargers we're going to talk about today. I mean, these turbochargers are getting now, now getting smaller and they're yielding more, more power, you know? So you kind of have to kind of have to scratch your head and think like, how did that end up happening? Like our turbochargers are getting smaller, but they're making more power. Yeah. That's, you know, that's something I'd really like to, to kind of talk about today as we, as we, um, you know, talk about turbochargers. I think that's where I have some confusion is in, as far as my knowledge of turbos, what I was used to in the past that people would run and this massive change where they all went to be electronically controlled and, and they're variable. And I think it's the emissions that drove it, but I wanted to ask you what, what has been the main driving force of turbos changing over the last 10 years, five to 10 years? You know, the, the, the big driving force there is having um, a lot of data, you know, really paying attention to what happens, you know, on a fundamental level with an engine. You know, of course, you know, a turbocharger, a turbocharger's function is to literally extract free energy from the engine and turn that back into mechanical energy and then, you know, in turn, run a compressor wheel and get that air into the engine. But in the world of turbocharging today, you know, there's so much technology on how that air is transferred, how, how that exhaust gas energy is transferred from the engine through the turbine section into the turbine wheel and extracting as much of that as possible. And then, and then, you know, as far as the compressor section is, is having the compression stage or stages, you know, be as efficient as possible and, and make, you know, get the density we need and, um, not so much as these huge boost levels. So, and that's where you're seeing the technology today is, is, is the efficiency of these turbochargers in those areas is really where, where, you know, this huge power is being yielded from. And, and really, you know, the, the nasty word is what, what's driven all this, you know, is emissions hundred percent. You know, if if we go back just a couple of years and let's go back to the five, nine days, you know, everybody in their brother had a a secret sauce turbo, right? And you could get a you could find turbos in every shape and size and form, every every type of configuration you could possibly imagine, you know, different compressor sections and different turbine sections, you know, T3s, T4s, round, I mean, all it's like anything you could think of. And and you know, and everybody would kind of build like different manifolds, you know, whether they're homegrown or whatever it is, just kind of strapping these turbochargers onto these diesels. Well, you know, when we were dealing with open exhaust, you know, especially the, the, the heyday, like the cowboy days, I like to call them <laughs> of diesel, you know, when the, when the five, nine got popular, you know, I mean, 12 valves made the five nines popular, but really common rails is what really got really interesting. When we, when the, when the first common rail came out in 2003 on the 5.9 Cummins, 
that was something that was kind of technology that the aftermarket had just never seen. You know, nobody nobody knew hardly anything about Common Run. And, you know, we we literally took such a huge jump um, in industry, you know, when the when of course the Duramax came out in 2001, that was the very first common rail for the for the light duty pickups. And then quickly to follow was 2003 Cummins, you know, went from a 24 valve to a common rail. Um, and we started seeing just an explosion in horsepower numbers, you know, and torque and drivability. And for that reason, you know, you know it, it really it, it really started this industry of performance and, and hot riding and the aftermarket just got, you know, so big. Um, and the and the turbocharger, you know, literally came right behind that. So as the as, as the engines would spin bigger turbochargers, you know, everybody started building, you know, putting like these huge turbochargers onto these engines, you know, because more air basically means more power. And it you didn't you didn't have to be a rocket scientist to do it. I mean, you didn't have to. I mean, literally, if you put the wrong size turbocharger on an engine, it's going to be a little bit slow to spool. You know, it's going to surge. It's it's not going to drive right. You know, so so there was you know this whole time frame from you know like around 03 you know pretty much all the way up into the six seven era you know when when you know the deletes were just rampant every you know every diesel that was out there from like 07 when the emissions after the mistake system came out pretty much about 010 you know like almost all those trucks were were deleted at that point so it's like this so this just this mess of um, turbochargers, like just being thrown on the, these engines, it was just out of control, just out of control. And you're seeing, you know, these 800, 900,000, 1200 horsepower street engines, you know, being driven all over the place that had these ridiculously big turbos on them. Um, and yeah, they made a lot of power, but they, but they just didn't really, they didn't perform well, you know, they didn't come up. They weren't very, they weren't responsive like a gas motor. And, and, if you look, if, so if you look today, you know, we have, we have turbochargers that make these diesels run like a gas motor on the bottom. I mean, there's like no lack, you know, they're incredibly responsive. And, and what got us there was as soon as, as soon as we had to start understanding how a turbocharger needs to work with an after treatment system, which basically means that you cannot afford the luxury. You cannot have black smoke leaving that engine. You know, you cannot have soot levels that are that are much more above measurable um, going into an after treatment system. Otherwise, it kills the after treatment system. So, so those of us that really paid attention, you know, to to how a turbocharger is supposed to work and how it needs to work and the science behind them, you know, it, it pretty quickly started start, started forcing technologies, you know, in into these turbochargers and. You know, in in like the, our VFR series, for instance, you know, all 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 turbochargers now are variable geometry, right? They're either a v, v, VGT or a VNT. Um, VGT stuff, you know, which Cummins uses, it's very old technology. Um, you know, it came out in two thousand. I mean, when it came out prior to 07, but we started seeing it in two thousand seven on the six seven RAM, and it literally is the same turbocharger that that ram uses today i mean if you buy a, a a 23 truck you know ram truck it is literally the same turbocharger that came out in 2007 you know some little upgrades to it but but like cummins says you know cummins the whole set turbo they don't they don't claim that that's a performance turbo they say right in in all their literature that it is, it's an emissions device you know and and that turbocharger does work well as an emissions device because it you know, it, it does a pretty good job of clamping down the turbine section and driving the EGR loop, which, you know, driving the EGR loop is what, what is needed, you know, to keep NOx down. You know, NOx is that invisible gas that, you know, is that, 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 that we struggle with so much in the aftermarket. So, you know, when you're balancing particulate matter and CO and NOx, you know, th those three, you know, they're, they're kind of a trade-off, right? And in order to get in order to get performance and emissions, you have to have a turbocharger that is adjustable, essentially. So, so you know, so coming like 2007, 2008, 
you know, 10, 15, that's when things really, really started to change um, in the industry. Because if you didn't have a good handle on your turbocharger technology, then you, you kind of get left in the dust. And that's why today there's only a couple of turbocharger companies out there, you know, that are really doing things right, you know, and, and having, you know, not only that to make it more complicated is just because you're doing something right doesn't necessarily mean that you can legally sell it. Because in order to legally sell it, you have to go through all this testing. You know, you have to have federal certification. You have to have ARB um, certification. You know, and if that, so it means if you don't have that stuff and you're selling it, you haven't gone through the testing, you haven't made sure it works. You have to prove that it that it works, that it that it that it's at least meeting a minimum of factory standards or better. Then you essentially can be shut down by our government because you because you're selling something that's not been certified. So, you know, th that can get into a very deep discussion, sometimes a very deep, dark discussion. <laughs> right. Um, but th but the fact of it is, you know, internal combustion engines, you know, diesel is uh, it's alive and well. And, and it's, it's, it's exciting times. You know, the, te the technology that ATS has been working on, we have some incredible products coming out. Um, a lot of them we're just launching now, um, just coming out. And and I'm not talking to like just brand new, um, you know, 22, 23 trucks. I mean, we're talking retrofitting, you know, these new technologies onto older vehicles, you know, the 5.9, the 7.3 of all things, you know, all these older motors. And I'm telling you, it, it's probably one of the most exciting things to me is, is drive these older trucks, you know, with, with newer technology um, components in them. And it's like it's a it's like a brand new truck, but it's yeah. your old truck, right? Yeah. I mean, some of these are like open exhaust trucks. I mean, we're talking, you know, like a you know ninety five, ninety six, ninety seven, you know, or or you know a lot of these older trucks with with newer newer technology turbo on them. Um, it's, it's it's incredible. It's awesome, you know. So you know the engines haven't changed all that much, but the things around them have really changed, you know. And having the having you know full computer controlled, um, you know turbine sections, you know, that keep these things matched to the engine properly, you know, is really, is really where the world um, is going, you know, and, and that's where the world's at. So it's, it's, a, it's exciting stuff. That's where the market, I was, it was like a trip down memory lane when you were talking about like the 07 to 10 time frame. And I remember back then it was, if you had a six, seven Cummins, or I'm sure any of the other, you know, Duramax or the power strokes were a little bit different with the six, four, but it was, I'm going to get rid of this, this VGT. I'm going to throw on this 67, 72, 75, whatever turbo you want. You could get the tuning. So there were no codes. You'd go out there, make your six, seven, 800, 900 horsepower, maybe a little bit more. But through that, like you'd mentioned with emissions and testing and data, it started to pick up a bit. And I, I think of friends I had at that time or enthusiasts that I met. They weren't interested in a variable turbo because they could go get, you know, the 68 millimeter or the 72 or 71, whatever size it was, throw it on their 6.7 and they could just drive. And the market is so different now through you know, some of the conversations we've had talking about emissions, some of the other podcast episodes I've done. And you're right. Like I had noticed recently going on websites and I was just curious and I was poking around and some of these categories I hadn't looked at in a really long time. And they used to be filled with product. And now I see two, three th things maybe. And I know it's because of the testing and, you know, before a company offers something, does it, does it meet those requirements? But then on the other side of it, there's so much advancement that's happened with emissions on performance with tuning turbos, fuel systems, the transmissions to handle it. So it's almost like it's coming together in a way where the trucks are making even more power. They're still staying within that emissions testing parameters or requirements that are needed, but you need a little bit more than that whole set factory charger. That's just designed for stock power, but you still need to work within the framework of, of the truck. And that's where I thought chatting with you about this day would be really fantastic because a lot of these trucks are designed just the components are designed to meet that factory power rating. And once you do tuning or something else, well, you're outside of the efficiency of the turbo, you need something else to, you know, to, to couple with it, to get the power and the torque. Yeah, no, no, you, you definitely hit the, the nail on the head there. And, and that's exactly what it is, you know, with the, 
I tell you what, things have changed so much with with emissions controls. And, you know, one of the things like, say, emissions really, really pushes the auto manufacturer to do is is work on advanced technology, you know, and, and advancing that, that technology um, is the only way to hit those requirements. And in almost every case, you know, anytime emissions drives an engine manufacturer or the aftermarket um, to be better, you know, it forces us to come up with new technologies and, and be better. And that's really what, you know, and, and you go back, you know, talking about years past, you know, and, and uh, you know, 2007 to, to 10, especially, you know, all the, the, the fad was, and almost the only thing you could do is get rid of the, the VGT, right? Yeah. Well, the problem is the VGTs back then, they sucked. I mean, they didn't work very well. You know, they just didn't work well. You know, they, I mean, they, they worked, they worked okay to, to drive the, to get, get the engines to the emissions levels they needed to be, but they were terrible performance turbos. And, you know, it took us a while, you know, to figure that out. And, and, you know, you talk about, you know, you, you were just talking about the terminology of 62 or 64 or whatever. That's all referring to the compressor size, right? I mean, for all these years, you know, nobody looked at the turbine section, you know, and that's one of the, that's one of the areas we have been spending so much time in development. I mean, we've spent, we've spent more dollars on the engineering side of the turbine housing than the compressor housing for a long shot, you know, and our Aurora turbochargers, you know, have been tried and true forever and ever. You know, we had our Aurora 3000, Aurora 4000, and those are all fixed geometry turbos. They're all designed for, you know, prior, um, you know, to have an after treatment systems, which is basically pr generally prior to 2007, right? And they were amazing turbos. And we spent, you know, just so much time on the compressor section, you know, the design layout of the compressor housing the wheel how many veins you know what the what the what the wheel design was and i mean hundreds of thousands of dollars on compressor design you know and getting that efficiency and, and it was huge i mean because it, it gained us it gained it yielded us huge power you know on the on the compressor side and then but they were all fixed geometry turbine housings which means that a fixed geometry turbine housing is essentially a cast iron volute you know that is fixed it's not it doesn't vary at all and then VGTs came out, and when var variable geometry turbos came out, that meant that it had a mechanism in the turbine section that would allow the computer to adjust essentially the squeeze point or the nozzle. You know, so it would basically kind of allow the computer to adjust that nozzle at the end, so to say, on how the exhaust gas energy is is orifice down to create a higher pressure point, which you know that worked really well for and that's what Cummins still uses today um this is some of this really old technology i'm talking about that is that allowed a higher pressure point in the turbine or in the exhaust manifold which essentially would create a higher pressure on the exhaust side than the than the boost side much higher so it would drive the egr loop and that and that came out so if you squeeze that off then it would create more pressure in the exhaust side so you could shove shove more exhaust through the EGR cooler and back into the engine. And that inert gas essentially lowers NOx. So, you know, it was it was a good kind of a middle of the road kind of a band-aid to get these engine manufacturers to the point that they could meet the NOx standards. But it wasn't a performance gainer. So of course it wasn't by accident that the 5.9 when it came out with the with the VGT that it was came out bigger engine, a six seven. They had to have a bigger engine to compensate for the for the for the loss of horsepower because consumers aren't going to settle for less power yeah. you know you always they always got to have more right you got to have more power more miles per gallon ideally but you know so so when the, so when those engines came out you know with these vgts they just they were stepping in the right direction but they but they weren't performance oriented so you know, and the, when we started getting our hands on it, you know, we started realizing, man, we really, you know, we, we need to spend more time on the turbine section of these turbochargers because that's really where so much of the science and so much of this is happening is taking all that wasted energy. I mean, 30 percent of the of the energy that's burned in an in a internal combustion engine goes out the exhaust. You know, so how much so if you can capture, you know, a few points, a couple percentage of that 
and turn that back into usable power, then you're, then that's a net win, right? So, so really paying attention and studying and, you know, continuing to test on how do we build a better turbine section to get more heat energy out of the engine into driving our compressor. You know, that is where you start getting these big gains. Well, you know, it, it, it took years, you know, and, you know, ATS, I mean, we've always manufactured our own turbos. I mean, it, it's, you know, if you talk about industry standard, you know, it generally just about the entire industry, you know, takes a factory turbo and rebuilds it, so to say, you know, they take a factory core and like maybe rework the, the veins a little bit or put a bigger compressor in it, you know, I mean, you know, make some changes, basically make it new, but make a couple of subtle changes. We have always, you know, all the way from the beginning, from the Aurora 3000, 4000, you know, into our um, VFR line, um, you know, we, we take a design and, and build it from scratch, you know, and make it 100% drop in replacement. So not only does it physically drop in to the replacement of the factory turbocharger, but it has the latest and the biggest and baddest parts in it. So, or in sometimes maybe some of the smallest parts, right? Because it really, turbochargers are kind of getting smaller and they're getting smaller because we're finding all these efficiencies. So when you start finding efficiencies, you can make them smaller and you produce more power with less operating weight, you know? So, so, so that's really the, the world of, of uh, turbochargers today. You know, our, our V and T line um, is, incredibly exciting we're we're just we're just beginning to release that and that's a that's a true variable nozzle turbocharger assembly that doesn't use like a sliding vein um pack like for instance like the cummins you know so we've gotten away from this this non-performance emission turbo to a turbocharger that has the technology of you know 2020 you know and i mean when you when you talk in 2020 i mean we have enormous advancements in turbocharger technology that that can be combined into you know a turbocharger that's a drop in replacement that gives the very best performance the best spool up best energy transfer the best exhaust break the best reliability you know all the all the components of everything that we've learned over the last 20 years like what is the best of the best in a turbocharger and that is and, and that today you know is is our bnt um turbocharger line so, you know, it, it gets kind of a little bit confusing. We have our VFR um, turbocharger series, and then we have our VNT that we're replacing. And the VNT is, is almost obsoleting, um, or it's another step up above the VFR line. So, you know, very exciting times, really cool stuff. But when you see the kind of power that's being produced with these turbochargers, I mean, it's staggering. These things, I mean, these engines drive like, they drive like a gas motor, you know, literally, you know, at a stop sign, I mean, that's that's one of the things that always has driven me nuts about a diesel is when you go to accelerate, you know, to stop, you know, to stop light, everything's a drag race, right? You know, you got a trailer <laughs> on the back, like I need to get up to 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 make my intersection, whatever. And it's kind of like step in the throttle and it's kind of laggy. And then, you know, the the, you know, the little Toyota besides like, rah, you know, gets in front of you. And then you just finally get rolling like you're, and you, you're out powering him. But, you know, you need to like make this lane change or whatever, but it, but you kind of, you kind of killed you because you got across the stop site or the intersection before you, right? Well, those days are over, you know, the new VNT stuff. I mean, these new turbochargers respond so quickly that they literally have the response, you know, of a gas motor, you know, so that rapid expansion, you know, that rapid torque on the bottom is as fun to drive, you know, and, and not only that, you know, you're picking up you know, economy with it and, you know, everything's just gotten better. So, you know, when we're talking about turbocharger technology, it really is, I mean, the, the combination of all of these components, you know, over time being built into a turbocharger assembly and control system, you know, that just optimizes the turbo to make, you know, to make the diesel run like it should. It's a really interesting point because I remember 10, 12 years ago, <clears throat> you would talk about drivability and performance and response and i was probably one of those guys more interested in the peak number you could hit on a dyno over what it might be <laughs> and i didn't understand i don't know i just that's where i was in my truck ownership kind of life is you know i just focus on that peak number and i think that's one of the hardest things to convey when you are thinking about a turbo upgrade is what is the difference if i go with 
this this different turbo. And so I'm thinking about whether it's Cummins or Power Stroke or Duramax and how you were talking about the design, the VNTs, the VGTs, and balancing the turbine, the compressor wheel, the sizing. How does that change the driving experience on a stock or, or close to stock truck? Maybe they have emissions on tuning and you know an air intake and just some minor upgrades. How is it different daily driving and towing with one of these ATS turbos versus stock one? You know, I mean, so first of all, when you say kind of what are the differences between like stock and, you know, like maybe a performance tune or whatever, that that's one of the areas that there's, um, when you're talking about airflow, the nice thing about airflow is when you have a turbocharger, say you, you remove the factory turbocharger and drop BNT on it, the airflow, these engines are essentially fueled based on the amount of uh, how, how much you can burn, right? So these things are all, all modern diesels are very much like a gas motor. You know, they're basically programmed based on what the fuel burn is. So Lambda, I mean, you have the amount of fuel that can be burned if they, when they start to overfuel, you know, they back fuel off. And if you, if you overfuel and you start be, you know, having particulate matter, right. Coming out of the exhaust, that means you're overfueling. That means it's going to, it's going to destroy the after treat system. It's going to clog up the, the DPF. So the fact, so one of the big keys, and this is why the feds are so on top and against, you know, aftermarket tuning, or they are just, they have their fingers on us so hard on when you start changing the calibration, because these cali- these factory calibrations are dialed in to maintain the survivability of the after treatment system, you know, and their, and the reliability, right? You, if you, one, one thing I all know, I mean, if you abuse a DPF, the after treatment system, then you have very limited time. You're going to drive your truck. You're going to kill it. It's going to be clogged up. It's not going to run. You're going to be replacing. It. It's very expensive. So the computer controls on these trucks are so advanced. I mean, the way they're, the way they're monitoring airflow, you know, and density and heat going through this engine. And most importantly is what comes out of the exhaust. You know, they, they essentially self-regulate you know, to make sure that the fuel that is being injected to the engine is being burnt. And that means when it's being burnt, that's that's the power you get. Any any anything excess anything beyond that, you know, essentially you're gonna have in layman's terms black smoke coming out of that engine, you know, it's gonna be absorbed into that into that filter, right? Well, when you add a turbo onto an engine like the VNT that is so much more efficient, you know, in the turbine section and the compressor section, then that gives you more density. I mean, you, and, and one of the huge things that, that we have been striving for is to have a turbocharger that's efficient enough to run closer to that one-to-one pressure ratio. And when you can run an engine, you know, that has about the same amount of boost pressure that it does back pressure, that means you're gaining on the, on the, on the exhaust side, you're gaining hugely on the efficiency side of it because you're not stressing that engine to get that exhaust out of the vehicle out of the engine, right? And if you're not if you're not stressing it to get the exhaust out of the engine, that means air can come into the engine much easier. So so when you start looking at the the engine itself, you know you have your engine, you have your exhaust, you have your turbine section, then you have it drives your compressor, and compressor you know forces air into the engine. Well, when you start when you start balancing the effects of that back pressure instead of having a much higher back pressure ratio than boost pressure ratio. And you can maintain a, a more even boost to, to back pressure ratio, then you're just taking stress off that engine and you're allowing that engine to breathe more freely. And if you allow, allow it to breathe more freely, that means you're basically you make more power at less boost pressure than what the than what the older engine or the same engine would with a less efficient turbo. So the you know the, there's a real science that takes place there. And when you and when you start getting to the point where you can control that that VNT so efficiently and you're redirecting that air into the turbine wheel and absorbing that that heat energy then you can essentially start slimming the turbo down then when you start slimming the turbo down then all of a sudden you start picking up a lot of torque in the bottom you have a lot less inertia and inertia so that means it spools so much quicker and then you start getting that realm of like more like a gas motor is when you step on the throttle it just goes you know, so so that's really, you know, kind of to make it really simple, 
you know, really where turbo technology is headed today. And that's where, you know, we're seeing these huge gains, you know, not only in uh, um, just overall power and substantially torque, but just the fun of driving, you know, and the reliability of the entire system, you know, so as you, as you begin to put all these pieces together, you know, in the turbocharger, then you start generating less gen- regenerations in the exhaust system, right? And less regenerations in the exhaust system means you're not forcing that region, which means you're not using excessive fuel to clean it, which means that you're not having, you're not stressing the after treatment system. So you have to replace, you know, these $5,000, $6,000 um, after treatment systems every couple of years because they've gone through so many regenerations. So, you know, the, you really have to look at the entire package, you know, the, the computer system, the, the calibration, the engine, the hard parts, the after treatment system, you know, all of it, you know, when you look at all of that in a whole, you know, that's where diesel performance is really, is getting very exciting. That's where the education in a conversation like this is so helpful because it's just, it's almost second nature to think if I want better performance, I want more power, I need to go bigger. But in these systems, like you just mentioned, it's not just the turbo itself and the compressor wheel. You're also talking about the turbine. You're talking about the calibrations. You're talking about the whole truck in and of itself. And then you're adding a newer, better technology to it. We almost need to change the way we think about usable power and torque and not just focus on what size is that compressor wheel, like you mentioned earlier when I was rattling right. off numbers. Right. And that's, that's where I, I think I understand it better now, or I see it where when I'm looking for a better driving truck, something to tow or haul with, or just have quicker response, I can't focus on it the way I used to 10 years ago or five or 20, however long it is, you know, that someone's been into diesels. I've got to ask these questions. How does it integrate with the rest of the truck? So in developing these, how, what's the process of that like? Because I think of, you know, you've got a Cummins, you've got a Duramax, you've got a power stroke, you've got these calibrations that are written for an emission standards. You have this framework that you need to work within as far as uh, keeping the, the parts compliant to work with these factory calibrations, but then giving that enthusiast a little bit more. That's where I'm super excited because it felt like for years, the aftermarket and diesel performance was just stagnant, so to speak. And I understand now it's because companies were testing. You talked about it all the testing and research and development you were doing to line all these things up. And it excites me again about a diesel truck and aftermarket parts I can run on. And I'm not just stuck with how the truck came from the factory. So what goes into it on, on the ATS side when putting this all together with all the variables that are there? Well, that is, that is a, that's, that's a loaded question. I mean, that's, that's deep. There's, you know, the, I mean, Man, where do I start with this one? You know, the, the, the level of the, the amount of dollars that we spend in, I mean, it's every day, Patrick, like every day, all day, every day, it is, it is constant testing, it's constant development, it's constantly, you know, working on, you know, the, the right combination, the right systems. And, and with that is all the testing that we have to do. I mean, not, not only do we do all this development, in-house but then we take these products you know and have to go and and get them certified right you know so i mean we'll spend two or three years working on technologies and these pieces and then going and building them and then we finally get them and then we have to go certify which um you know i mean let's talk about compound turbos or actually let's talk about this so just two years i have been we have had vehicles in testing at carb for our RAM and Ford applications. Do you know that just last week we received, we finally officially received our EO numbers for the RAM and the Ford all in the same week. So the 15 to current and the 15 to, or 13 to current RAMs, you know, finally started getting our EO testing, our EO numbers, official ER numbers for these, for the VFR turbos. Wow. Um, two years later, you know, and we're talking five years prior to that was all this testing. In development, you know, getting them to where we could get where we needed to be, and and what what really kind of pushed that along is um, we've we've spent we've been spending a ton of time on compound testing, right? So we have a set of compounds, you know, for the um, thirteen to current RAM that's all drop and replacement with our Vortec manifold. I mean, it's a hundred percent drop and replacement works on a factory calibration that two turbochargers 
running in a compound configuration to give us the airflow that will give you like that that power number, you know, 600 plus horsepower, you know, and incredible and just incredible torque and drivability, all with full emissions on, you know, I mean, all, all full emissions, right? So, you know, when you're talking about asking the question, you know, kind of what goes into it and is, you know, with these, these dark years, I mean, is diesel performance like there was this big stagnant, you know, time of like, you know, five to seven years when it seems like, man, what happened to all the diesel performance? It literally took that long, you know, for us to get all up on top of it and, and figure out exactly where we needed to be and how to get there and then build these components. And, and, you know, the same, same old five, nine, you know, that, that you drove years ago with compounds on it is a very similar setup to the, you know, to the truck that we're testing on right now. Um, you know, 2022 Ram, you know, six, seven with compound turbochargers, you know, compounds and it's small calibration and unbelievable performance. And yes, it runs circles around the old five, nine that had, <laughs> you know, completely open exhaust and would smoke black, you know, and these things are spotless. I mean, they're unbelievable. It's incredible. You know, so every day, you know, this technology is just getting better and better, you know, whether it's the, you know, the, in the fuel system, the fuel pump, the injectors, the calibration, the turbo, the manifolds, you know, the intercoolers. I mean, all the things that applied, you know, on the on the on the pre emissions truck, all of that stuff applies on the new one, on the new trucks, the emissions on trucks. It just applies. It's a, a lot finer resolution, much, much finer resolution. You can't just throw something at the wall and hope it sticks. And if it doesn't, it doesn't blow up your engine. You know, today, when you throw something at the wall, you know, it needs to work perfectly. Otherwise, your engine's not going to last. You know, the the, the whole system is going to shut down. It's it's going to leave you on the side of the road. You know, and it's it's just that level. You know, of of operations. You know, the way these things are all put together, and the way they're programmed, and the way they're monitored. That they just it won't allow you. You know, to do something that's too far out of the out of the envelope. So it's it's kind of like NASCAR racing, right? I mean, you know, in the old days, you know, they, you, you saw these radical changes. You know that these teams would do, you know, now it's a science, you know, everything is an, is an exact science in racing. You know, they're looking for, I mean, they're looking for a half or a quarter horsepower and that's a big gain. You know, in the old days they would pick up, Oh, we pick up five horsepower, 10 horsepower. You don't get that anymore. It's the same way with diesels. You know, we just pick up, I mean, we pick up little pieces, a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit there and, you know, put them into our designs. And, you know, once we get them all really defined and get them, Perfect. Get them tested. Make sure everybody's happy, and then you know we offer them to the public. So that was your, that was kind of like a big reason why there was this this dark air of like no performance parts for diesels. You mentioned compounds, and those always get me excited. And I wanted to ask you through the testing that you do, what is the difference between <clears throat> say, I guess you could take six seven Cummins, or it could be any truck, um, but where you have a stock turbo. Then you have the VFR, and then you have a compound set up. What would somebody notice if they just got a short test drive, kind of a joyride, to go in these trucks? The difference between stock to VFR and then VFR to compound setup. You know, generally, I mean, like stock to VFR, you know, you're, you're going to pick up a little bit better response and substantially better mid-range drivability, you know, mid-range torque. Um when you go to compounds, everything just gets amazing. And when you go to comp, and, and one of the things that we, you know, obviously th- one of the cool things about compounds that allows us that, that we've really, that we've really started to move on, on the 19 to current Ram um, is since you're talking both turbos, I mean, both of these turbos are custom built, right? So our high pressure turbo is actually quite a bit smaller, you know, saying things are getting smaller and making more power. We've gone even smaller. And that allows that turbo to just come up so quickly that you get just instant torque, you know, and then you get to rely on the bigger turbos. It starts to fall in and our control system, our IntelliBoost basically controls both of the turbos between the engine and the turbos. And it maximizes the the primary, the high pressure turbo to do its job on the bottom and then flowing in, then open it up and flowing and allowing the, the turbo, the big turbocharger to do its part. So, you know, when you're talking about a truck that's compounded, the drivability, I mean, the, the response time, the torque, the air density you're getting down below is just epic, you know, and then it doesn't fall off. I mean, it just continues to pull into this 
huge mid range and then this phenomenal top end, you know, and, and the best thing I like about them is the towing ability, you know, because today, and this is something that, you know, we've really been focused on and these trucks are coming out with 500 horsepower. So it's not like they need more horsepower, but they need to be, you need to be able to sustain the horsepower. And that is the biggest, that is the biggest problem with, you know, the Ford Dodge GM trucks is they get hot. You know, I mean, that turbocharger is only so big. It has to be, you know, it, it, they have to make sure that when I say that they, the OEM, you know, the OEM has to make sure that that turbocharger comes up to speed quick enough that it gives you the torque on the bottom and keeps everything clean. Well, the sacrifice comes from the higher power levels and that higher power levels, you know, generate heat. And when you start generating heat, you have no choice but to turn the fueling down. You know, so, I mean, you, you take any one of these trucks and strap a, a real trailer to it, you know, something, I mean, you're grossing, you know, 25,000 pounds or whatever, or, or generally more. But, you know, you you take off and you start hitting the rollers, the hills, you know, or here going up the mountains and you're, I mean, you start taking power away, you know, because they just get hot. Everything is, everything is hot and it's all, the heat is basically derived, you know, from intake charge, you know, and back pressure. You know, the, the engine is just churning so much fuel, you know, with the lack of oxygen into the engine that they just get hot. So the only thing that can be done is the calibration has to take fuel out of the engine. I mean, you might be wide open throttle, but you're not getting full fuel like you were when that engine, you know, was 180 degrees. You know, so when you when you put a more efficient turbocharger on this thing, like I was talking about, you start, start dropping back pressure. You know, then all of a sudden you start dropping heat and that means you maintain a lot of fuel at the higher power levels and it doesn't have to derate. And, th and this is this one of the areas that, you know, the the general the general public, I mean, when you go down to drive this truck and it says hey, it has 500 horsepower, thousand you know pound feet of torque, you know, you know, like that's the truck I need. This thing is awesome. Well, you hook your trailer to it and you start doing real work and you don't have that kind of power anymore. You know, and, and that's really where we have been focusing on not necessarily let's give you more power out of the gate, but let's give you sustainability. Let's give you that power to maintain it. You know, once we get that point, then we can start turning that power up a little bit. And you we wrap that all around, you know, this package, you know, with the calibration, the turbo, you know, things that are legal to sell, you know, a good, you know, warranty on all of it. You know, that to me is where the consumer wins because they, they get, you know, a good you know, a good value for the dollar they're putting in these trucks. And, and, you know, they just have a lot of fun to drive and they keep you, keep you from being on the side of the road. <laughs> that makes such complete sense. It's like a light bulb went off in my mind with the way you explained it, because it, we do, we focus on the, it's kind of the horsepower torque war that's been going on forever, but especially recently Ford with their six, seven, and then, you know, Ram's going to do something and GM's going to do something with the, uh, the Duramax. And we think about that number and we think that's plenty for what I need to do. That's plenty for my trailer, the trips I'm going to take, you know, what I'm hauling, but are you actually getting that? And can you in with a factory turbo, you're not going to be able to achieve that sustainability like you said or the usability across the rpm range so that helps me understand okay this is this is what this turbo gives me and then if i want to really step up my game and go to compounds <laughs> what i get with that <laughs> and that's what truck owners want they want that sustained power level they want it at ideally any rpm range that they're at and they don't have to make sacrifices like they did in the past and say well there are no turbo options for me i just got to live with my truck it's not it's not like that anymore and that's it's one of the huge takeaways, I think, from this conversation and learning more about these turbos is the way you guys have approached building them and adding in not just the fun factor, but lowering temperatures, more torque at different RPMs, um, not having to derate the engine because it's getting so hot. That's that's huge for diesel performance. Yeah, no, that's that's I mean, that's always been the kind of the killer. But but again, you know, with the with the after treatment systems, man, it changed the game. I mean, it, it made it so hard. It yeah. made it so hard on everybody. And you can, and you, now that you're kind of getting an idea of like what's happened here, you know, when, when that exhaust started getting restricted, you know, how it made the, it, it, having to go back and really look at the engine, you know, what, what, how can we squeeze every ounce of performance or, or airflow out of this motor, 
you know, to make it do everything it is capable of before we before we shoot it out the the tailpipe or or into the you know into the filter, right? So, you know, but but it but it really is something else. I mean, it really works, and and I got to say, I mean, the OEMs have done an incredible job, you know, it, which they were obviously forced to, and it's just made us start sh- sharpen our pencil. But you know, all these years of racing and developing, and and especially for ATS, I mean, being we manufacture. You know, it, it's a, it's such a cool thing, you know, in my shoes, because my dream was always to be able to build the, the very best, you know, take the very best components and technology and put it all together, you know, and, and it's taken years. I mean, it's literally taken 20 years of just reinvestment and and finding people my, like myself, you know, geeks that are just into the stuff that have have all the knowledge, you know, and collectively being able to essentially almost manufacture, you know, the whole vehicle, the whole engine, you know, from scratch and taking, you know, this idea and that idea and all the best stuff. And, and, you know, and one of the cool things about, I mean, the aftermarket is unlike an OEM, you know, that's, that's, that is limited on this budget, not that we're not, but not where I'm going with it, but that they're limited on this budget when they build this thing, you know, the bean counters say, Oh yeah, you don't need that good of a turbine section. You don't need that good of a compressor wheel. Oh, you don't need that expensive a material. You know, you, you can cut some costs here. So what it does, and I see it every single day when we're, when we're designing these, these uh, components, you know, especially on the turbochargers that, you know, it's like they could have built something that is just absolutely amazing, but it would be very expensive. And that's where I sit here and we are lucky enough that we get to pick like the very best of all these components, the very best of everything, the best material, the best design, the best electronics. I mean, the most expensive stuff and put it all into one unit because we've been manufacturing stuff for so long. You know, we do enough of it that we can keep that cost down. And really today, what ATS gets to deliver is when you get an ATS turbocharger, it is the very best in technologies, of best of everything we can get our hands on, and we put it into one unit. And that's what's really changing the industry today. And that's and that's exciting to me. And that's cool. You know, so that's really, you know, sums up ATS the best is, you know, being able to take all of those combined knowledges and all that technology and, you know, finally being able to put it into one package that bolts onto a truck that makes people like you have a big smile like, this is cool. Yeah. You know, this is, it's very fun stuff. It's well, pretty I awesome. Pe- I know people watching or listening, they're going to think, hey, this is, this is a lot of great information. I really I understand more about it. Can I get this for my truck? What year range trucks, what engines do you guys have products for? I know you'd mentioned the 7.3 and the 5.9 common rail, but what about you know the, the Ford and the, and the GMs? So between between Ford Dodge and GM, I mean, going all the way back, you know, geez, I guess all the way pretty much to '94. Um, I mean, way back, you know, on the Rams, you know, our our product line is pretty full, pretty much from you know, twelve valve, twenty four valve, common rail, six seven, all the way up to twenty two. Um, the Ford line. Um, we have a gap on the six four. We don't do much um, on the six four um air of a vehicle or engine just because they were so limited um but obviously full offering on the um six liter um actually offering quite a bit we're about to offer quite a bit on the seven three and i'll kind of get back to that a little bit the new you know six seven eleven to current um one of the one of the really niche areas in the market that is huge for you ford owners that have an 11 to 14 six seven or eleven to sixteen cabin chassis Ford, those particular Fords um had a had a unique turbocharger. So the eleven to um fourteen twenty five hundred um regular pickup truck six seven diesel had a what they call the twin scroll turbocharger. And the little Garrett twin scroll was like a double back compressor wheel that in theory, was kind of cool because it would because it would it had had a really low operating inertia operating range, which allow would allow the compressor to spin up relatively quickly. So it gives you a boost at a lower RPM. The problem is the compressor hangs so far out on the stem that it wobbles and it blows up. So we even reproduced that turbocharger, thinking that we could put bigger bearings in it, 
and just the inherent design of it, we could not even make that turbocharger hold up to the dur durability that should. So we so we we removed we moved away from that design. But what we have, what we're releasing, is a VNT version that drops in place of the ca the cabin chassis truck from the eleven sixteen, or our other kit is the eleven to fourteen twin scroll. And this VNT is everything I was telling you about. It has the huge bearings, the latest turbine section, true all true VNT, um, Aurora compressor section. I mean, all the all the very best in technology hydraulic actuator. That's a hundred percent drop in replacement for all of the early Ford trucks. So those eleven to fourteen trucks that are just they just can't keep alive, and especially these cabin chassis trucks. Because do these these turbos are small. You know the the the, the eleven to sixteen. Ford turbos were were pretty small turbos, and what the industry has been trying for years, and and every and a lot of a lot of companies are still trying to do it, is they're taking a fifteen style turbo from the Ford, and they're bolting it onto the earlier eleven to sixteen, or you know, cabin chassis to the eleven to fourteen um, normal twenty five hundred trucks, and try to run them on an emission system. The turbo is too big; it it, it fails the the DPF every single time. So, you know, we, we, you know, I, I was in, involved in a study where we were really working on the calibrations and, and trying to make these work. And we just, we finally realized that that turbocharger was just too big. You know, the compressor and the, tur the turbocharger itself is just physically too big to make work. So we decided we're going to tool up and we're going to design a turbocharger that's going to fix this problem. So our new, our new Ford VNT um, drop in application completely drops in place of both of these Ford trucks, which is going to be huge for these guys. Cause I mean, we're talking utility trucks. We're talking, you know, grandpa that has his, you know, finally bought, bought his beloved truck and wants to drive his fifth wheel and the stuff just doesn't work. And these guys don't want to delete and they can't delete, you know, yeah. which is, which, you know, and we, and obviously you don't want them to, I mean, those systems are fantastic, but they have, they need something that's going to work. So, you know, I decided we're going to go ahead and, you know, take the time and spend the money and build a 100% drop-in replacement turbocharger that works on these trucks that uses 100% factory calibration. And we are just releasing that. So we're, we expect to have that ready um, sometime in, we're thinking, uh, end of October, maybe November. Um, so that's, that's really exciting stuff. And then, you know, our, um, our RAM um, VNT stuff, will be coming out next year, which is, I don't want to talk about it too much right now. I mean, we got our VFR stuff that is just amazing. That's kicking butt. Um, all the VFR line, it's all new stuff. It's all a uh, brand new actuator. The, the very latest compressor section, um, our, our Aurora compressor section, um, all stainless turbine sections. Um, in, incredible. I mean, it's fantastic turbos. Um, those also have EOs on them. So, you know, you don't have to worry about, you know, any issues with, uh, you know, selling in California, or whatever, or if you're a California owner. So, you know, pretty much full offerings on everything, um, all the Duramax line, um, pretty much from geez, the beginning of time to current. Um, so anything that's, you know, just about anything that's, you know, Ford Dodge GM, you know, that is, um, this is in the last 15 years, you know, we pretty much got you covered. So, so good place to be. That's really cool because sometimes during uh, conversations about parts, it's something really cool I'm chatting about, but it only applies to one year range of truck and we'll get comments and listeners are like, well, when are they doing it for my truck? When's it coming out? So it's really cool to see these <laughs> huge year ranges that you guys cover with it. So no matter what truck you have, the technology, the education, the things you talked about today, they can take advantage of on their 5.9, their Duramax, their Power Stroke. And I think that option with the 11 to 14s, 11 to 16 cabin chassis Fords, that's going to be massive because that's always been such a huge issue in the market where their factory turbos failing and they needed a solution. And there's probably millions of those trucks on the road still. Yeah. And they get yeah, those hard. Yeah. Those guys have really been hurting. I mean, they really have been. And, you know, they kind of got, they got by with it for all these years because they finally, even the guy that didn't want to delete, you know, he's like, fine, I got to go to work. So he would finally throw his hands up and like, fine, I guess I'm going to delete my truck. You know, so I can have a turbo, they can put a turbo on it that actually doesn't blow up. You know, now those options are gone. Yeah. You know, it's like guys are, I mean, these trucks are just parked. 
I mean, I hear so many stories, you know, these guys are like, there's dying for options. I mean, literally like they go and buy a new truck because they can't keep their truck on the road, you know? So, so, I, you know, we're really excited about that, but real quick to circle back on the seven, three, um, you know, I'm an old seven, three guy. I always love that, that, that seven, three truck. I mean, I had many of them and, and I know there's a bunch of guys out there that absolutely die for the seven three. So we did not spent the time to build a um, complete. So our old Aurora turbo system used to work on the, that we used to have the old seven threes. We get rid of the backwards replay or the, the reverse rotation turbine chart, turbocharger and built a new pedestal, the whole deal. I revitalized that tooling and found it and revamped it for the new VNT. So we are actually going to be offering a 22 style VNT turbo kit for the seven, three guys, wow. which has a full exhaust brake in it, <laughs> rapid spool up, incredible um, uh, airflow in the turbine side. Um, and, you know, we don't expect to sell a lot of those, but I think it's going to be cool for these guys that are just like seven, three, seven, three avid owners, you know, that like want to revolutionize their, their seven, three engine. Right. Um, and the last little thing outside of this conversation is I'm also releasing an Alice conversion for the seven, three. Oh, so wow. they're, they're both going to come kind of come out at the same time, but they're not cheap, but it's pretty cool. I mean, a wow. six speed automatic on a seven, three with a VNT, that'd be pretty sweet. Wouldn't it? Oh yeah. Well, th they're one of the most passionate ownership groups I've ever talked to of any brand. Those seven, three guys, they love them. And you think about, do I want to go spend, 80 to 110,000 on a new truck, or do I want to invest money into this platform that I love, that I'm passionate about, that I've had for a while? Maybe there's a story behind it, the reason that they've held on to it. Why not put this newer technology on it and still keep driving it and still have more power and more options? That's it's one of the big things I've learned in, in uh, doing a podcast is there is no there's no it's kind of like the gas world like whenever something comes out and it makes 10 more horsepower or 20 people just flock to go get it diesel it, it seems like it doesn't die out there's still people who love the first gens love the obs fords love the lb7 duramax and it's 2023 and they're still buying parts still looking to do stuff for them so i think you might sell more than just a few of them <laughs> i think it, <laughs> it's gonna be a big hit but it was great to chat with you today this was a topic i wanted to cover and i didn't know a lot about it i, I wanted to understand kind of the principles behind um, turbo design on newer trucks. And it's really exciting to see we're no longer in that stagnant period of diesel performance. You guys are working on some really cool stuff. So I appreciate your time chatting with me today, Clint. Had a great time as always, Patrick enjoyed and we'll see you next time. Don't forget diesel fans, make sure and head on over to dmaxstore.com If you've got a LB seven L five P truck looking to make some upgrades, make it run better or be able to just keep it running uh, the best that it can for as long as it can. They've got a complete lineup of parts for you. Um, upgrades. They love to chat about Duramaxes. So if you have one of those trucks looking to do some either upgrades, maintenance, not quite sure what direction you want to take it, definitely hit them up, ask them some questions. They love to chat with you guys and be able to make sure you get the truck running the way that you want. Just head on over to dmaxstore.com and check them out. Also want to give a shout out to some of our Patreon supporters, Tyler Lowen of 23 Diesel, J. Cole John, all of our other Patreon supporters, all of you who subscribe on YouTube podcast apps, follow us on social media. We appreciate all your support here in your seven of the Diesel podcast and look forward to bringing you more of the content that you guys want to hear in 2023. Until next time, keep the shiny side up.